There are taxable accounts, tax-deferred accounts, and tax-free accounts. And finding the proper balance of your investments in each type of account, that's called tax diversification. Today on Your Money, Your Wealth, Joe and Big Al will help you figure out if you are tax-diversified enough. And they'll confirm once again how capital gains and ordinary income work. Plus, should you contribute to your tax-deferred traditional 401k or IRA or to your tax-free Roth IRA or Roth 401k? What are the withdrawal rules for a direct rollover from a Roth 401k to Roth IRA? What can you do about excess contributions to your Roth account? And just to mix things up, are municipal bonds a good idea for conservative investors? I'm producer Andy Last, and here are the hosts of Your Money, Your Wealth, Joe Anderson CFP and Big Al Clofine CPA. Let's go to Susan. She writes in, hey, Joe, Alan, Andy, I'm writing from the suburbs or maybe exurbs outside of Atlanta, Georgia. Hotlanta. So Susan, she drives a 2005 Acura MDX. That's kind of sexy. And have an eight-year-old lab hound mix named Rex. I have two questions. One is maybe more for Joe and maybe one is for Al. Number one, I've been converting traditional IRA funds to my Roth IRA over the last several years, all while staying in my 12% head of household tax bracket. I currently have about 45% of my rollover traditional IRA, 25% my Roth IRA, and 30, uh, 30% in non-qualified brokerage accounts. I recall one of your episodes talking about spreading investments among taxable, tax-deferred, and tax-free for flexibility. Should I continue to convert the traditional IRA until I'm closer to 30, 35% in each type? Or is a, another percentage desired? I have uh, about 19 years until my required minimum distributions. Uh, let's see. We don't have a ton of time. Let me, let's me let take a break, Al, and then I'll, let's kind of dive into that. Let's slice that open a little bit more. Yeah, there's some different ways we can go with that for sure. Right. And then, um, and then we can talk about, this is a really good question too. She's got a, a question on capital gains that are stacked. Yes. On top of ordinary income. That's the exact term I used, stacked on top. Yep. And so this is interesting stuff because a lot of times people get confused, and especially if you're doing Roth conversions and trying to zero out your capital gains. Yes, because um, you can get some surprising uh, effects with that. Absolutely. And she's she's asking Al, hey, you know, I, I've heard about tax diversification. She's got a certain percentage in 45% in, in like pre-tax or IRA dollars, 25% of her liquid assets are in Roth dollars, 30% in uh, non-qualified brokerage accounts. So she's asking, you know, is there a better percentage? Am I, am I diversified? And I would say just, uh, you know, we don't know how much she has, but just from a percentage standpoint, those look pretty good. Yeah, I, I would say she's in great shape. I, I think the, the better way to think about this, Susan, is – are you in a low enough tax bracket where Roth conversions still make sense? And if they do, keep going. Keep going all the way up to RMD age, which is 19 years from now, required minimum distribution age, or even longer. You can do conversions after you hit 72. You don't have to stop if you're in a low enough bracket. Here's what I would do if you really want to you know, put some uh, pencil to paper here. Is that, so she's got 20 years to 72, so she's... You know, she's in her 53. early fifties, right? Yep. Uh, she want. I don't know if she's working or not. Um, but how you want to look at this is when you start needing to take money from the account is really going to de- is your diversification is really going to come into play there because it's how much money that you want to generate from the portfolio is key. If you want to grab, let's say, fifty thousand dollars a year from the overall portfolio. Right, your mix is probably just fine. But if you want higher income, but pay lower brackets or pay lower tax, you probably need less in the four hundred one k and more in your brokerage account and Roth, because it's like, all right, well, you want to take money from your four hundred one k or IRA or pre tax accounts to get you, let's say, to the top of the twelve percent tax bracket. If you're single, that's forty thousand dollars. So you pull from there, or if you have Social Security, depending on what your Social Security is, maybe that's. I'm just going to throw a number out, 20 grand. So then you pull another 20,000 from your 401k plan. So that's 40 grand. So that keeps you right at the top of that 12%. 
well, well let's get more complex. Now another, <laughs> right? Then you got your standard deduction. Let's call it ten thousand, right? Yeah, so I, you was, get... I was going to bring that up. Last time I did a simple example, you stopped and said, "Alan, do you understand how taxes work?" <laughs> I was going to do the same thing, but you right. beat me to it. But it, I, right, because it's complicated. There's a lot of moving parts here. <laughs> So you got to look at, well, what's your income need? Is it $100,000? And then take your 100000 minus the standard deduction and then pull money from your 401k to keep you at the 12% tax bracket. If you want more income, then pull from your Roth IRA or pull from your non-qualified account. But how much more income do you want outside of that 12% tax bracket is going to depend on your tax diversification strategy from now until age 72 is my point. Yeah. Okay, so that's a lot of words. <laughs> I don't know if anyone can take that and use it. But here's what I would say. I, I would say 19 years out, just keep converting as long as you're in a loan up bracket. But if you're closer to retirement, for those of you that are, say you're going to retire next year, a couple years from now, whatever, um, then you can do that math to say, all right, how much do I want to spend? What's my fixed income? Now I kind of have a better sense of that. And I want to make sure I have enough ordinary income to fill up the 12% bracket. In other words, why would I do a Roth conversion in the 24% bracket if I'm already going to have my RMDs in the 12% because my balance is so low? So that's the that's the math that you do. But you kind of, to me, Joe, you have to be closer to retirement because 19 years away, it's anything can change, right? Yeah, but 19 is her RMD age. So she's 53. So she could retire at 55. She could retire at 16. She right. could. You're, you're right about that. Or maybe she's currently retired. I, I don't know. Susan, you know, she's cruising around in her Acura. Got an eight-year-old lab named Rex. She's yeah. probably retired. She's listening to us. Most people are super successful. Listening. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, they listen to us maybe two, three episodes, and then they're good to go. <laughs> they're fine because they can't take it anymore. <laughs> um, so the simple answer is, yeah, just convert to the top of the 12 if you're in the 12. If you're going to be, if you're going to convert to the top of the 22, just make sure that your RMDs are not going to be less than the 22% tax bracket. Tax rates are going to go up in 2026, so you got to take a look at that. It's going to give you more flexibility. If you get more money into the Roth, it's not going to hurt your um, uh, Medicare premiums because Roth doesn't count for Irma's you know, increase in benefits. Um, it also could create tax-free income for your Social Security because Roth distributions do not count in provisional income. So you could potentially have a very high income later in life um, and, and, and virtually pay zero tax. So she's in the 12% tax bracket. Keep converting to the 12. Does it make sense to convert to a higher bracket? Well, it's going to depend on how much money that Susan has in her retirement account. Hey, Al, let's talk about stacked up. So we had a previous episode. You mentioned capital gains are stacked on top and don't change the tax bracket. Okay, can you confirm that my understanding is correct? Uh, for the first time in several years, I sold some stock in my non-qualified account. This stock was from a former employer, so I could buy a discount from my 401k match, uh, was also in company stock. I want to reduce my exposure to the single holding. This sale was um, a gain, but should have zero tax consequences because she's in the 12% tax bracket. I use my annual expected self-employment income, my expected dividends in this gain amount to estimate adjusted gross income. Then converted funds to my Roth based on the amount available within my tax bracket using the calculated AGI. Does the stacked on top that Al mentioned mean that I can convert additional funds from my Roth equal to the gain amount while still staying in that 12% bracket? All right, so let's let's kind of break this down a little bit. So when you're in the 12% bracket, and and um, so Susan, I don't know if you're married or single, but um, let's just head say a household, head of household, head of household. Okay. Oh boy, now you, now I got to look up what the <laughs> what that table is. But the the top of the the top of the 12% bracket for head of household is fifty four thousand. Okay, fifty four thousand of income. All right, let's say taxable income. So that you know, Joe already you already kind of went through this. Your income minus twelve thousand dollars standard deduction, roughly. So let's say she does that calculation. She's at forty thousand dollars, right? So what did I say? Fifty four. Mm -hmm. Yeah, fifty four. So there's fourteen thousand of room. Okay. So now you can sell uh, stocks with fourteen thousand of gain and pay no tax. If you sell, sell stocks with 15,000 of gain, the first 14,000 is tax-free, but the extra thousand is taxed at a 
tax rate. That, that's the way this works. So you can't sell everything. It's just to, to make sure that you stay below that uh, that 54,000. Okay, that's, that's how the capital gains work. Now, when you do a Roth on top of that of 14,000, because you think you got 14,000 of room, so the Roth purchases your tax income to 54,000 already. So now if you do a capital gain on top of that, you will pay 15% tax on the capital gain. So you don't get to do both. And here's what happens, uh, we've seen happen, is people try to do both. They try to do a Roth conversion to the top of the 12% bracket, and they try to do a capital gain to the top of the 12% bracket. You can't double do it. You only get one 12% bracket. And when you do that, it becomes a very expensive Roth conversion because if you think about it this way, your Roth conversion is taxed at 12% because you're in that bracket. Your capital gains, which would have been tax-free, got pushed up into the next bracket. And now they're taxed at 15. So now at single dollar of Roth, you're paying 20, uh, you're paying 27% tax, right? Yeah. Because of the 12% plus the 15. So, and I've seen that happen. And, and in the old days, you used to be able to recharacterize in the following year before you filed your tax return to fix it. Now you can't, you're not allowed to recharacterize. So just be very careful. I'm combining Roth conversions and capital gains when you're in the 12% bracket. Yeah, because the capital gain sits on top, right? It stacks on top. So if you did the conversion to the top of the 12, which is 54,000, so now you used up that 12% bracket and then you the, you, you sell the, the capital gains is on top of the 54. So yeah, even they're... though it's not, it, you're, you're going to be taxed at 15% because it, it sits on top of the conversion. Yep. All right. Um, hopefully that clears things up, Susan. Appreciate your um, questions. Very good questions. Appreciate it. Uh, we got Tim writes in. Tim the stalker, Andy. Is that who, who this is? Um, yes. Yes, it is. <laughs> got it. Okay. Uh, I'm so I, glad Tim's the stalker instead of me now. <laughs> yes. He's out of control. This guy <laughs> follows me everywhere. He's in line at the grocery store. He's like, hey. <laughs> I got, I got a Roth question for you. All right. How are right. you? Get, get away. I'm Tim. <laughs> Tim, you crazy man. Um, Tim writes in. He goes, hi, I'm a longtime listener and have appreciated the excellent response to the question I've had. Um, you've had a lot, Tim. He's worse than Bruce. I mean, these guys are just milking us, Al. They are. It just never stops, right? When listening to your recent comments on 401k conversions to a Roth IRA, I thought of a tax question. I transferred a portion of my government TSP to Roth IRA at a brokerage house, just enough to keep me at the top of the 24% income tax bracket. The TSP or thrift savings plan does not transfer its fund, but cashes them out and sends the cash amount to my brokerage house. Even though the TSP cash was going to a Roth IRA at the brokerage house, the transfer became regular income added to my tax uh, year, causing a significant tax burden. Since the fund and the TSP were long-term, held for many years, shouldn't that income be considered long-term capital gains and taxed at the long-term capital gains rate versus ordinary income at the 24% tax bracket? Or because the TSP cashed out the amount in sent cash, does that just become regular income, even though it went to my Roth IRA? I have since transferred the remaining amount of my TSP 401k to a new traditional IRA at the brokerage house and purchased ETF stocks and mutual funds within that traditional IRA. The brokerage house can convert the stocks, ETF, mutual funds to my Roth directly. If after a year I convert the traditional IRA assets to a Roth IRA, will that be considered long-term capital gain in tax at the lower long-term capital gains rate? Thank you. So Tim has asked multiple questions over the years. A longtime listener. Yes. Is he really comprehending anything that we're talking about? Well, he's he asked and he asked several questions here, but they are all the same question. So uh, here's a, this is what scares me. He goes, "I'm going to convert to the top of the 24 percent tax bracket." So he's already thinking, "Yeah, I'm going to be paying 24 percent. That's why I'm converting to the top of the 24 percent." Yeah, I, I agree. So we get we got to through the second or third sentence. I thought, okay, so far so good, and then it all went south after that. Right. Then he's like, well, wait a minute. Then they cashed out my TSP. So when, when you when you go from a four hundred one k or a TSP or four, well, any type of employer sponsored plan, as you do a rollover to get the money out, of course they have to cash it out. They're not going to transfer shares. If I have an IRA, let's say at Fidelity, and I have a Roth IRA at Fidelity, I can transfer shares in kind. 
but he converted to the top of the 24% tax bracket. Then he's like, wait a minute, should that be long-term capital gains? Well, no, that's the whole reason why you do the conversion is that you're getting rid of the, you have to pay the ordinary income tax for it to forever grow tax-free. The whole basis of a lot of our shows because of all these questions that come in is about Roth. And we want to get rid of the tax deferred ordinary income tax treatment of those accounts by having tax diversification by putting money into the Roth. So if he already saying I'm going to go to the convert to the top of the 24, then he's shocked that he's he got hit with a huge tax bill. Well, I don't I don't I don't understand where else we go with that. Well, let, let me say it another way. So we, we like to draw little circles of three different kinds of taxation, right? We like to call it the tax triangle. But the third one, you know, one is tax deferred, one is taxable, one's tax free. Tax deferred, that's an IRA, that's a 401k, it's a 403b, it's a 457. Always, 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 when you take money out of any of those accounts, it's ordinary income. Ordinary income, never, never, never capital gain. Whether it gets cashed out or you trade, you do a conversion of shares in kind, it doesn't matter. It's all ordinary income. That is right, Joe. That's why we encourage people to get money out of those accounts so they can either have tax-free or capital gain in the future. The only way it would be capital gain rate is it if it was net unrealized appreciation, right? You could take company stock out of the 401k plan and move it into a brokerage account, sell that stock and pay capital gains rate. But it was in a TSP, it's mutual funds. So he took the money out. It's going to be taxed at ordinary income rates. The top of the 24%, you're going to pay 24% on those dollars plus the state of California, I think, is where you live. Um, so, yeah, but then all those dollars will grow tax-free. So uh, hopefully that helps, Tim. Uh, appreciate the the uh, the email. Wow, it's not often you hear Joe or Big Al say always and never so emphatically. Hopefully that will help this ordinary income versus capital gains thing stick in all of our heads. By the way, a number of people have asked, and the discussion of capital gains sitting on top of or stacked on top of ordinary income has been discussed several times in previous episodes of YMYW. So I have linked to a pile of those in the podcast show notes at yourmoneyyourwealth.com. Click the link in the description of today's episode in your podcast app to hear a refresher on capital gains versus ordinary income, to send in your money questions and comments, and to spread the word and share all of this cool stuff with your friends, either via email or on social media. We got one from Brian, Queens, New York City. Hello, Joe, Al, Andy. This is Brian from Queens, NYC. He's a school teacher. Thanks for answering my very lengthy question in Podcast 275. I continue listening to the podcast every week and enjoy season six of the television show. Great scene, Big Al out there in Hawaii. Jealous. <laughs> Smiley face. <laughs> It was pretty cool, I must say. Yeah, it was great. I took the advice you recommended from my first right. In right in. Oh, right in. Thank you. Uh, and switch future contribution uh, contributions from pre-tax 457 to Roth 457. Yeah. All right. You guys thought with my maxing out 403B and 457 pre-tax totaling $40,000 that it was possible I'd be in the 12% tax bracket. However, that is incorrect, as I failed to mention, my wife is also employed and actually the breadwinner, putting us in the 24% tax bracket for 2020. My wife is 40 years old and looking to stop working in about five years. From her previous employer, she had a 401k, Roth 401k, which she did a trustee to trustee direct rollover to a traditional IRA, Roth IRA. Now, starting in 2020, she is using the Roth conversion ladder strategy, converting a portion of the balance each year, paying the taxes from general savings so she can have uh, tax and penalty free access to the Roth funds after five years uh, when the conversion requirements are met. We will attempt to fill the 24% tax bracket using the strategy. Her current employer, she continues contributing to 401k, some pre-tax, some Roth 401k. When she separates from service from the employer, once again, she'll do a direct rollover. Uh, 401k goes into the IRA, and then the Roth 401k goes in the Roth IRA. My question is the following. As we know, contributions to a Roth IRA can be withdrawn at any time. Conversion to a traditional IRA funds to a Roth IRA can be withdrawn after five years. But what are the re rules regarding direct rollover to Roth 401k funds to Roth IRA? Do those funds have a five-year clock? 
Can they be assessed immediately or must you wait until 59 and a half on those funds to receive tax-free, penalty-free withdrawals? Thanks again for all the terrific information. <sighs> God, they could have shortened that question up way. <laughs> it's like, here's, here's a hint. What's the five-year clock for a Roth 401k? Love, Jason. <laughs> or love, Brian. <laughs> well, it's a it's a good question though. It's like what what happens to the character of your Roth contributions in a 401k plan if you roll it to a Roth IRA? That's that's what the question is. Correct. And and his statements are right, right? In other words, when you do a Roth contribution at any age, you can withdraw the money at any time. You don't have to wait five years, you don't have to wait till fifty nine and a half. You just have to wait until the earnings till you're fifty nine and a half. Now, when you do a Roth conversion under 59 and a half, that's where there's a five-year clock for every single conversion because the IRS doesn't want you avoiding that 10% penalty by simply doing a Roth conversion, right? And then turn around and spend the money tax-free. So that, that's why that rule is there. Yeah, but, the fi- well, I guess the five-year clock on conversion is that you have a five-year clock for each conversion if you're under 59 and a half until you reach 59 and a half. That is true. And once you're 59 and a half, that doesn't apply anymore, right? Yeah, the, with each conversion, because then they're not avoiding the 10% penalty because they're over 59 and a half. So they have access to the principal of the money, but the earnings still need to seize them for five years or 59 and a half, whichever is longer. Yeah. But if you've got, if you have money in a Roth 401k, some of that's contributions and some of that's earnings. So have whatever it is in the Roth. Uh, 401k rolls into the IRA, same, same. So let's say you have $100,000 in a Roth 401k and 60,000 is contributions, 40,000 is earnings. So 60,000 is treated like a contribution, right? So you could withdraw that at any time. And then 40,000 is earnings, right? So you got to wait till 59 and a half on that. So I guess the question for me um, is, what 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 is he really trying to get at here is is what I'm well, trying I, to figure out. I, I think he's trying. Yeah, he's trying to figure out how his wife can spend money at age forty five. Right? Is that you? I mean, don't take it from the Roth, right, Brian? Don't do that. There's other ways to create income because you want to make sure that the Roth money continues to parlay for you and your family tax free. That's a whole reason for that. You got to give it time. So if you're thinking, all right, well, if we're doing these conversions and this and that, she wants to retire in five years, um, are you looking to spend the money? Is that what you're trying to do? Uh, Because if you roll the 401k into the Roth IRA, then you're fine because you've already had these Roth dollars for over five years. Um, But are you trying to get money from the overall accounts? You're you're, you're just taking principal and then let the the earnings grow tax-free. I would be careful. Don't even do it in the Roth. Don't even invest. Go into a brokerage account if you want to have a bridge there because you're going to screw this thing up. You're going to probably, you know, how you're filing and you're, oh, well, this is pre tax or this is after tax dollars that came from this 401k and trying to track all that stuff. Um, if, if you're trying to look at a way to spend money prior to 59 and a half, um, you know, start building a brokerage account, start building non-qualified dollars. I would not take the money from the Roth. It just defeats the purpose of, uh, you know, especially his age of saying my wife wants to retire at 45. And all of a sudden you blow out all that Roth money, which could parlay for another 20 years. And you're going to have three, four times as much tax free. You got to look at long term here. Yeah. It just depends if that's their only choice though. And she really, 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 really wants to retire at 45. Then it can work. How about that? All right. Uh, we got C from Jersey. C-E? Or C? That's correct. C-E? I, I don't know. It, it was C-E with capital C, lowercase e. So I'm going to go with C. Not C-E. Or maybe it's say. Not sure. Say. Could say. be. Huh. Okay. Well, help me out there. I, I would there. Say, say C. Let's, Let's go, go with C. 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 Okay. Hello there, Dynamic Trio, Joe, Alan, Andy. I'm a big fan of your podcast and YouTube channel. You made IRA, Roth IRA. We made IRA, Roth contributions in early January 2020. 7,000 wife, 7,000 husband. 
Also, a IRA to Roth conversion of $35,000 was made in June of 2020 this year. We made significant gain in the stock market that will push our income above the threshold limit, Maji 206. We're married finally jointly. My question is this. What is the best way to correct the excess $7,000 contribution? So they put in seven grand each for Roth IRAs. They also did a conversion of $35,000, Alan. But then he's saying, you know what? We made significant short-term gain in stock market that will push our income above the threshold income where the Roth contributions are no longer available. So 206 is the, um, the amount for a joint couple. So then he's saying, how do I get out of this thing? Right? Yeah, so how do I undo it? Right? How do I recharacterize is the, the, the correct term. So a few questions that I would have is that, well, first of all, the $35,000 that C made is not applicable in the Maji calculation for your Roth contributions. Yeah, I think that's the first key point to make. Agree with you, Joe. So when you do a Roth conversion, it's not included as income for the modified adjusted gross income number of 206000 to see if you can do a Roth contribution. So you can keep that part out. But but let's just say the stock gains p- without the 35000 pushed them way past the two hundred six. So what, do you think he's day trading the account? Or, I mean, are they realized gains? Is the gain inside the Roth? Some people get kind of confused. It's like, all right, let's say he did a, uh, because he did the conversion in June. He converted 35,000 in June. And all of a sudden he's looking at his balance today and it's 50,000 because the market has been on fire. Sure. Um, The the market has COVID or something, right? It's running from COVID. (laughs) Yeah. It it, it It, it makes zero sense, right? It's recovering (laughs) very nicely. Yeah. It's laying in bed, drinking some. It's got immunity. It does, yes. Um, so a- anyway, so yeah, if the gains are in a Roth, don't worry about it. Doesn't matter. Yeah, but, but some let- people think, all right, well, I converted thirty-five. It's now worth fifty. Do I pay tax on fifty? It's the amount of dollar that you converted. It's not what the end of your balance is. True, that's a good point. But let's just say <laughs> it's in a brokerage account outside of retirement account that all these stock gains were. So you have a couple choices. One is you can withdraw the the IRA and the earnings before the due date of the return, April 15th, or if you extend the return October 15th, and then you will not be charged a penalty. You will have to pay uh, income tax on the earnings, number one. And number two is if you're under 59 and a half, you got to pay a 10% penalty on the earnings part, just, uh, just the earnings. The second thing, which might even be cleaner, is if you haven't, uh, uh, if you if you if you talk to your brokerage house, you can just recharacterize the Roth conversion, Roth contribution, contribution. sorry, Roth contribution to so an IRA. IRA contribution. And the IRA contribution then would have basis of the seven thousand dollars. Right. So you put seven thousand into the Roth. The seven thousand, let's say, hypothetically grew to eight thousand. Then he finds out. I have too much income because we killed it in my day trading Forex trader, right? He's all over the place. Right. And so it's like, shoot, we got to recharacterize this. So he could just take the money back, take the $7,000 back. The thousand dollars would be taxed at ordinary income rates. Um, and then there could be a 10% penalty assessed on that thousand dollars, depending on how old C is. Right. Or you just recharacterize it into an IRA contribution. You have $206,000 of income, so you cannot take the deduction. So you're going to have basis in that overall IRA. And then guess what you do? You convert it into a Roth. And you would just pay tax on the $1,000 of gain that the IRA made. And once again, Al, each question has a backdoor Roth solution. (laughs) But somehow it always comes back to that, doesn't it? I wasn't even going to bring that up. You did. <laughs> well, that's the right play. I know. I agree. Yeah. So you just recharacterize the 7,000 into an IRA, and then you take the IRA, and then you convert it, um, as long as you don't have any other IRAs, because then you got the pro rata and the aggregation rules. Yeah. Well, that's a that's a huge point there, and we could spend like another 10 minutes on that. <laughs> 
Um, so hopefully we pronounced your name right. C from Jersey. Uh, C E C E from New Jersey. Um, so, all right. We'll appreciate your question. Due to popular demand from the Your Money, Your Wealth audience, we will be publishing our ultimate guide to Roth IRAs very soon. It'll explain in depth what a Roth IRA is and the benefits of it, how a Roth differs from a traditional IRA and from a traditional 401k, the rules for Roth contributions, conversions, withdrawals, and more. So now when you have a question about Roth conversions in the future, you'll be able to simply consult the ultimate guide to Roth IRAs rather than getting Joe all worked up. Click the link in the description of today's episode in your podcast app to go to the show notes and subscribe to the YMYW newsletter. That'll ensure that you will be able to access this comprehensive resource about Joe and Big Al's favorite topic just as soon as it's available. Then you can help us spread the financial fun and knowledge by forwarding the newsletter to your friends. Uh, we got Jason from Nashville. He goes, I know you guys, especially Joe, love the Roth account. My wife and I are in the 35% tax bracket. I have the option to put money in a Roth 401k. Would you put my 401k contributions into a Roth 401k, or would you recommend with our tax bracket to stick it in the traditional 401k or some combination? Also, I got a backdoor Roth question for you. Just kidding. Figured that out. Thank you, Jason. First of all, we don't give advice here on the show. True. Suggestions. We're we're just we chat. I don't chat. even know their suggestions. Yes, it's kind of having an open chat. <laughs> it's open chat. <laughs> uh, okay, thirty-five percent tax bracket. Alan, he's got the option to put the money into the Roth four hundred one k. What what say what 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 you and Jason are sitting down in Nashville listening to a little country music having a couple of pops? Yeah, you, let me let me get going. Hey, big big Al, right? Uh, what do you think? I'm in the thirty five percent tax bracket. Should I go Roth or pre tax? Are we listening to Willie Nelson or? Um... <laughs> doesn't matter. Just some good doesn't old matter. honky tonk music. Okay, Blake Shelton. Sure. <laughs> um, I would uh, I would put most of it into a regular traditional 401k because they're in a high tax bracket, but I would at least put some in the Roth 401k just to start a five-year clock. That's what I would do. How about you, Joe? Um, I know what you're going to say. Oh, well, you know the answer. <laughs> I know I would, your answer. I, I, I gave you my answer. That's yeah, what I would do. I would, I mean, I, I would, I would put it into the Roth 401k to be honest with you. Um, I don't care what tax bracket people are in. Just because they're not going to save the tax bracket. They're not going to save the deduction. And if they're yep. in the 35% tax bracket, right? And if they're only saving $19,000 a year, I'm not, I don't know how old Jason is. Yeah, but there's a lot we don't know. Right? There's a ton we don't know. He lives in Nashville, right? I love Nashville. And I wish Jason would invite me to Nashville and I could hang out with him and his wife and we could talk. And then you him. could get into it and find I out could, what yes. the answer should be. But all right. So what is the bottom of the 35% tax bracket, Alan? Oh, gosh. Let's see. Is he? Yeah, he's married. Okay. Bottom of the 35% tax bracket is 400. It's, yeah, 450 yeah, 400, grand. Yeah, 414. Okay. He's making over $400,000 a year, right? So by saving a couple of bucks, by putting $19,000 into the pre-tax 401k versus the Roth, I don't think he's got the option to put a lot of money into Roth because he makes 400. Let's say he saves a reasonable amount of money. You know, I don't know, maybe tw- if he saves 10% of his income, that's 40 grand. If he saves 20%, it's 80. So maybe he's saving 20% of his income, right? You're, you're, I just think with people in high brackets, the more money that they, they can get into to Roth IRAs, I think the better they're going to be. Because the tax deduction is not nearly as big as it was in previous years, right? If people were making four hundred thousand dollars in the eighties, they would get a seventy percent tax deduction, not thirty-five, right? So I don't know. I, I just don't think the tax deduction because he's going to have to pay it back anyway. People in that bracket, if they're young, they have savings. We see how big these four hundred one ks and IRAs get, and where do you think tax rates are going to go from someone that's in the thirty-five percent bracket today? If they, if they got a ton of savings, they'll probably be in that same bracket or higher. So I would hedge as much as I can into a vehicle that I know that I'll never ever pay taxes on it again, because the the nineteen thousand bucks, 
right? So he saves five, six thousand dollars in tax by going pre tax, but I guarantee you he's going to spend 10 times that um, in the future. I don't know so, about 10, I don't know about 10 times. But yeah, so it's so going to be. The, the the quick math works this way. If you're going to be in a, we're if, out of time. If, if you're thinking you're going to be a lower bracket in retirement and you save the tax money, you're going to do better doing a traditional and using my approach. All right, and, and a story. Yeah, do what you want to do, Jason. But I would go rock. I got Brian writing in, uh, just personally, I guess. He goes, "Hi, Joe. Love the show. I like oh, how yeah. it's in quotes. It says <laughs> Joe in quotes, like he doesn't really mean you." Now, what the hell is that all about? It it's, even... a, it's it's a dig. Hi, Joe. <laughs> Hi, Brian. What a... <laughs> and uh, uh, he's a dedicated listener to the podcast. Well, you know what? Some of these listeners that are dedicated, I don't really care for. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna throw that out there. Right he said now. he just recently became, so don't chase him away. Well, hi, quotes, Joe. Maybe know. that's the, maybe he thinks that's emphasis. Hi, Joe. Maybe, maybe. Got it. Got it. Yeah, yeah. Let's let's figure out how to stroke your ego because apparently that has to happen every question. Exactly. He's he he could have done all caps, but in Joe, it it means you're like royalty or or something exalted. Got how about it. That? And, and Alan, I don't even get credit at all. That's that's, that's all right. I I don't need my ego stroked at all. <laughs> I'm I'm secure. Yep. Oh God, boy. Okay. Oh, just some thoughts came to my mind. <laughs> I'm not going to go there. I'm debating between contributing to a traditional IRA or a Roth. Because of the prior shows on Roth conversions and back to a Roth IRA contributions, I'm leaning toward making the Roth contribution by the end of the year. I'm curious, is there a scenario or a certain set of circumstances where you wouldn't recommend contributing to the Roth and instead tell your client, in quotes, to contribute? He's a quote guy. Okay, so yeah, he's got quotes all over this question. So is there, is, yes, Brian, if you just listen to another episode, because I guarantee you'll be answering this question. Look at your tax bracket, right? I think people should go Roth because it doesn't matter. They don't save the tax deduction. So if you put $10,000 into a 401k plan and you're in the 25% tax bracket, you save $2,500. So do you save that $2,500 into a non-qualified account? The likelihood people spend it. If I go straight Roth IRA and put $10,000 in there, I do not save the $2,500. But that $10,000 grows to $20,000, $30,000, $50,000, $100,000. I pull it out. I don't pay any tax whatsoever. If I get the tax deduction today of $2,500 and that $10,000 grows to $20,000, $30,000, $50,000, $100,000, whatever it is, when I pull the money out, that's when the taxes are owed. So if I pull $100,000 out at 25%, what do I owe in tax? Twenty five grand. So I save twenty five hundred dollars on the front end to pay twenty five thousand dollars later. In that example, that will probably never happen. It's hypothetical, but you get the point. So what? What if you save twenty five hundred dollars and that allows you to buy a more expensive home because that's an extra two hundred dollars a month and your home goes up by exponentially because you live in Southern California? You do a lot better with that with that saving the tax money. Yeah, well, then hire a financial advisor to run those numbers. Don't ask us on a stupid podcast. <laughs> Got it. Right? Did you, you should have done stupid podcasts with air quotes. <laughs> Are we even a podcast? I guess. Okay. Uh, another question here. For a conservative investor, what are your thoughts on municipal bonds? Bank interest is basically zero. I have a few CDs that are maturing and looking to get better returns. Would you recommend moving money into muni bonds or California muni bonds as a source of fixed income versus a savings money market account? Can you handle a lot of risk that can't handle a lot of risk? So investing the money in stocks or mutual fund isn't an option. Thanks again. Um, we don't give advice, Brian, but... Um, yeah, it depends on what your tax bracket is. Yields are really low. Uh, so it's what is what are your goals? What are you trying to accomplish? You know, you don't want to go in stocks. I get it. Would you go into um, tax-free California municipal bond funds? Sure. Why not? Um, FYI, I own tax-free California municipal bond funds. So they... <laughs> I'm not getting a lot of interest on them, no. uh, but, but they're safe. And the income and interest I do receive is tax-free. I, I think um, sometimes people 
that, that have been burned in the stock market, maybe they invested in the stock and it went down and they think the stock market doesn't work for them, that I would suggest to you, and there's been all kinds of research, Harry Markovitz did a study uh, that came up with a theory called the inf uh, efficient frontier. Wow, are you name dropping and then you're throwing and then I, <laughs> Yes, I, yeah, and Harry and I, we go way back because I saw him at a seminar once. <laughs> Now, here's the point, though. Forget your comment. Yeah. Here's, here's the point. You know, my <laughs> old buddy, Harry, and I yeah. know. Yeah. Nobel, Nobel lariat. The, yeah. the, point, the point is this. Owning 10 to 20% in stocks is actually less risky than owning zero just because they tend to balance out each other. So that's my point, Joe. Got it. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for that <laughs> Nobel that, Prize that work. Of the yeah. yeah, I wonder who, who's the most famous person I actually know. Maybe Joe Anderson. Uh, I don't could know. be. Could yeah. be. Well, let me tell you about this time I met Harry Mark. <laughs> I don't think I said that. <laughs> Let's rewind the tape. More on Brian's air quotes in the derails, and Joe tells his story of living in Atlanta again. So stick around to the end if you're into that sort of thing. Your Money, Your Wealth is presented by Pure Financial Advisors. Click the Get an Assessment button in the podcast show notes at yourmoneyyourwealth.com or call 888-994-6257 for your free financial assessment. That's 888-994-6257. Pure Financial Advisors is a registered investment advisor. This show does not intend to provide personalized investment advice through this broadcast and does not represent that the securities or services discussed are suitable for any investor. Investors are advised not to rely on any information contained in the broadcast in the process of making a full and informed investment decision. I wonder if he's at like a party and, you know, he's like, I was talking to quote unquote Joe. <laughs> You know those quote people? I hate the quote people. I think I mean, those are that the... and like people that talk in third person. Yeah, I was just saying, doing... if somebody does both, they're done. If they're doing air quotes and third person, I guarantee Brian's that guy. I, th I think if they do air quotes, they do talk in third person. I think that comes one and the same. <laughs> well, Brian was listening to this new podcast and became a dedicated listener, quote unquote. <laughs> <laughs> you remember there was an episode of Friends where Ross did a couple quotes and then Joey started trying to do the quotes, but he, he got the wrong words. He didn't know what to quote, uh, what to air quote. Yeah, well, that's Pretty probably Brian. I lived in Hot Atlanta. You lived there, what, a couple years? Yeah, I lived in uh, right outside of Buckhead. So uh, Midtown. It was the Darlington, Alan, the Darlington. The Darlington. Um, yeah, okay. when I when I left the Darlington, they, they were like, oh, congratulations, man. You got out of here. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was low income housing. I was, it was right across the street from the Piedmont Hospital. Yeah. Um, anyway. <laughs>